you're throwing me completely off my my own list of questions here because you're you're, you're throwing in some new ideas and tangents here because I went, well, my other question was going to be so do you think uh, HIV exists and has it been isolated by here you continually refer to this virus and, and the instance you're just referring to people going from being seropositive to negative how do we know that that's a change in status rather than a quirk with the tests. I mean, how do we know how much we can trust these tests, even repeat tests, if they're from the same batch, for example? Um, is it possible? I mean, I, you can go ahead and answer those questions as you wish or not. Uh, does it? I know some people in the dissident community would like to get you on record of whether or not you think HIV exists and whether it's been isolated. But I'm, I'm, this is making me think of a whole other question, which is, is it possible that we sort of went off on a, on a track early on with this and we're, we're missing something else um, that maybe should be called something different than a retrovirus, or something that we've not really understood completely? Obviously, that something is going on and something is being detected. I, I, I think it's obvious. But I'm curious whether we, I don't know if I trust science enough to really know what they think they know. Well, you know, uh, I know that the dissident community wishes to have, everybody wishes to have uh, like a transient uh, answers, yes or no, exists or does not exist. Uh, when you're talking about science uh, and when you go into these questions, uh, you have to be a little bit more metaphysical or philosophical. And you have to decide whether you want to discuss about pure science or you want to discuss about medicine. So you have to decide uh, uh, what is your field of interest. As far as the purification issue is concerned, we all know, everybody knows, including Montagnes first, uh, that the isolation of HIV was not performed according to the traditional criteria. But it, it also has to be said that uh, in those days, please remember that uh, uh, in 1980, uh, 1987, I was at the National Cancer Institute working in the same office with Peter Duisberg and Robert Gallo was at the sixth floor of the same building. We were at the first floor while I was working with Dr. Stu Aronson and Peter Duisberg came for about six months. He spent six months in the laboratory and we were sharing the office and uh, Robert Gallo, Dr. Robert Gallo, was working at the sixth floor of the same building. So. Uh, we could meet Robert Gallo almost on a daily basis at the cafeteria or in the elevator. And in those years, a new technique was being developed. That was the PCR, the polymerase chain reaction, invented, by the way, by the Nobel Prize uh, Kerry Mullis, whose opinion about HIV is well known. And Robert Gallo was quick to uh, identify the PCR as a good tool to bypass all the tedious, very tedious and long procedure to isolate the virus according to traditional criteria. Up to the point that he had the first PCR machine in that building and many of us who were working on oncogenes, so a completely different uh, field, went up to the sixth floor to use his machine because it was the only machine available. So the fact that the virus was not isolated according to the traditional criteria, that is the electron microscopy, was also due to the fact that this new technique was emerging in those days and everybody wanted to use that technique to identify not only viruses but also genes that were responsible for tumors as, was, as it was our case at the first floor. Now, in recent, in recent uh, days, uh, the idea that HIV could be one of the so-called endogenous retroviruses uh, has emerged. We too are working uh, as a side project. So we are working just uh, with lukewarm enthusiasm about this project. 
but it is easy and it is cheap to check whether there are sequences of RNA or DNA if you prefer in the uh, viral genome that are somehow homologous to the human genome. So far we have found none. I remember that at the Rethinking AIDS conference in Auckland in 2009, Peter Duke, Professor Peter Duke presented uh, data that already uh, disproved the hypothesis that HIV was a part of the human genome. This, this hypothesis is not a dumb one, it's a very smart one, because the human genome is composed uh, for about 8% by semi-retroviral sequences. So we have in our genome many, many retroviral sequences that have integrated in our genome during the course of centuries or millennia or millions of years. According to some theories, retroviruses are essential for evolution of genomes. So it would not be surprising that HIV could have been one of these endogenous retroviruses. But so far, this does not appear to be the case. At this point, we have to discuss. First, what do antibody tests detect? That's easy to answer. Everybody knows that antibody tests, by definition, are not 100% specific. So antibody tests could always detect something else. And this uh, is true for all antibody tests. So let's forget about the antibody test. And let's ask ourselves, what does the PCR detect? If you ask uh, Professor Kerry Mullis, the inventor of PCR, Nobel laureate for this invention, he could answer and we learned this 25 years ago, a PCR could amplify even water. To say that it depends on the condition that you use, but PCR can give you very tricky results. Up to the point that you find viral load in HIV negative people. This is so well known that PCR is not used for the diagnosis of HIV infection. As you may know, all over the world, for legal purposes, a person is defined as HIV positive only if he or she has antibodies detected by two methods, ELISA and Western blot. Now, when PCR was invented many years ago, everybody thought that that would be the solution to the HIV dilemma because the so-called window of time would expire, would disappear. As you know, if you contract, if you uh, are infected by HIV today, it takes about uh, one month, two months, three months to develop antibodies. During that period of time, you don't know to be infected, but you could be infectious. And so, you know, it's a real problem because you could spread the infection. And that's a reason as pure orthodox now. Everybody thought that with the PCR, this window would be eliminated because if you are infected by HIV today, tomorrow the PCR will be able to detect HIV RNA in your body. Now, please ask yourself, how comes that PCR is not used as a diagnostic tool, has no legal validity to detect an HIV infection? It is used, as you perfectly know, only to monitor the effects of therapy. That's the only use of PCR. And the answer is because PCR can be positive, you can detect a viral load in HIV negative people. This was demonstrated in 1995. And risk of interrupting you, being HIV positive and on antiretrovirals, it lowered my viral load to near undetectable. Now that I've got a shingles outbreak, I'm told that, that the herpes virus could send that viral load 
clear up, though, does that mean that the HIV virus has overcome the drugs and is replicating, or is it is there some some kind of fuzzy matter in this in this PCR test? Well, is it possible that it you don't want it to be subjected to three hours of lecture on molecular no, biology. No, I know we've already um, almost exceeded the entire time that I wanted to spend on our interview here, so it was, we can consider it a rhetorical question if you'd like. Uh, but, you know, uh, you know the answer. Uh, many people think that when you look at the so-called viral load, you count the number of viral particles in your blood. So many people think that this is, the, this is what happens. And this is not the case absolutely. The genome of the HIV is a small one. Nevertheless, the PCR amplifies only a minor, very minute part right. of that genome using uh, uh, things that are called primers that are specific, but as always, uh, not 100% specific. So there is the possibility that you label as viral load some sequence that is not related or is poorly related to HIV. And that's why there is this conundrum of a finding viral load in HIV negative people. And that's why people are still studying and publishing methods to detect HIV infection beside PCR, beside antibodies. Just wonder, if in 2012 people published in a major journal like Blood a new method to detect HIV infection, this means that the old methods are not, I would say, at least 100% reliable. Otherwise, there would be no need to look for new methods. Nobody looks for new methods to detect tuberculosis infection. I think in the interest of time, it's safe to say that what we have now is imperfect, but it's not. that does not make it useless. Is that a fair statement? To say that what we have, it is imperfect, is definitely true. Otherwise, nobody would care to organize AIDS meeting with 20,000 people. Nobody would care to publish papers, uh, refining uh, papers, uh, looking for new methods, completely new methods to identify HIV infection. So it is definitely very much imperfect. Then we have to discuss what has this to do with the health or the sickness of the individual patient. So if we are interested in this, we should leave metaphysics and philosophy aside and concentrate on that patient. And so we are changing our focus, we are changing our